You know, the initial operational plan was to establish practical boundaries for initial attack operations on the Ellison Fire, utilizing a contained and confined strategy. This is a unique ecosystem, and you know, we've been really focusing on trying to change the DNA of the fire program to not so much go direct, but let fire do what fire needs to do, and at the same time, be mindful of what, what its uh, consequences are. So we recognize the potential with this fire that we could do something just like that. We're here at the Drake Airstrip. We were lucky enough to fly in here as part of a reconnaissance mission to take a look at the fires. The crews that were in here, this was a three hour swamp buggy ride in for them, coming in by ATV, UTV. This is really the, the heart of the preserve. We're right on the eastern edge of the Ellison Fire. It was burning in everything. Pretty dry, I mean, early May is our dry season. It looked like it had started in a pineland and spread out into the grasslands and had moved around through the pine and palmetto that's, that's out here. And it had moved through quite a bit of cypress as well. And we had a group of us that got together and we looked at our options with the Ellison fire. The, square fire. the twist that occurred is as we were coming up with this plan, I was talking with the FMO at Florida Panther and just seeing his face light up with the lightning that was, was going on behind us. As our conversation went on, we started to hear the radio crackling and, and the folks that were up in the aircraft were calling in new fires. And so that was the square fire, the circle fire, the ellipse fire, the mist fire, and the triangle fire. We had a good plan with Ellison, but the greater context of our plan changed significantly on Sunday night. It was important to us to let the fire burn as naturally as it could across the landscape because it creates those different patterns with the burn intensity where you have areas that are unburned and areas that burn hot and areas that burn in between. We could also do our own techniques through firing patterns, through the time of day, similar to prescribed fire. We can moderate that fire intensity and kind of make the fire that we're setting work for us. As the fire came closer, burning in that natural pattern that it was, we also put some fire on the ground to create a burned out area between the trail and the wildfire. As the wildfire moved towards that fire that we had set, of course it ran out of fuels and it, it sat down. We let the fire come as close as we could to those areas, particularly here around the, the cabins in the center of the preserve. We put fire going at it from the opposite direction. Last number I had was there were about 200 structures that we had directly protected around, burning around the structures and actively going in there. In some cases, they were moving around and, and getting out into the fire area, using flappers to flap out the fire in light grasses. Uh, they were getting out and they were talking to the aircraft that were coming out and dropping water. Uh, advancing, nothing drastic, cleaning nicely through that uh, brush. But primarily, we, where we chose to engage this fire and how we chose to engage it was with fire. The people are very supportive of having fire out here, but of course they want it out there. As throughout the fire, the use of aircraft was critical. As we got spots on the other side of the trail network that we were using, uh, the aircraft were there. Some of the spots went over our line, but also in places to, to drop on the wildfire's edge and kind of moderate that. I mean, it's not stopping the fire, but it's slowing it down. It kind of gave us more time to keep moving along that trail system, putting the fire, our fire, ahead of the wildfires that approached the edge of the trail. Fire plays a, a big part in our ecosystem. That being said, we have some values at risk that keep us very concerned as fire managers. Red cockaded woodpecker is a species that has a lot of adaptations to fire, but their trees that they live in are very susceptible to fire. We had crews that would come out and clear about five paces around the, the cavity trees, remove all the fuels, and that would just, it would change the fire behavior as it moved through those areas. I and mean, it would hit the edge of that fuel break and then die down. And then the panthers, the panthers are again well adapted to fire, but when they're denning, the kittens are not mobile. And so that's something that we pay particular attention to is where the denning cats are. The panthers 
den in a really, really thick area, usually in saw palmetto thickets. But from a fire standpoint, saw palmetto is very volatile. That's why when we have a fire, we take preventative action. We will make sure that we burn around the area. Behind me is an example of a very good prescribed burn that was done just a couple months ago. Um, the benefit of prescribed fire is, is that it's, well, this is a fire adapted system. Without fire in it, the composition of the vegetation would change. Here are swamp lilies, very important preferred foods for white-tailed deer. Where you see a habitat like this and adjacent cover, that's where we find a really good deer population. And deer are the main prey of the Florida panther. The key aspect of big cypress that makes it beneficial to not only panthers and deer, but all the other species, is the fact that it's a mosaic of habitats. And in order to maintain this mosaic, fire is important. Fire is, in fact, necessary. The next item that really worries us, of course, the preserve boundary. And then finally, the, the two major roads that run through the preserve, I-75 and 41. That's really where the public safety aspects start to come in. It's a big deal to close down the highway, closing the road or parts of the road only if we have to. We have a, a forecaster, a meteorologist assigned to the fire to predict the dispersion and, and what the smoke is going to do out there. So they have the best information. Good morning, John Pendergrass, incident meteorologist from Melbourne. Uh, right now we've kind of transitioned during a very hot and dry period. Uh, for those of you who are new to South Florida here on this, uh, the calendar doesn't wait for summer here. It starts early. So we, again, work very closely with our partners, particularly Florida Highway Patrol, to monitor smoke on the highway through the night. There's a strong connection between hydrology and fire behavior in the swamp. When the water table is so low, when it drops one to three feet below where I'm standing, all the natural fire breaks, the low cypress, the cypress strands in the marshes even go dry. So when the wet season starts, just as it brings the promise of rain, it brings thunder and lightning at its periphery. So in this case, we had epic deluges on the Naples coast, with the big cypress being on the fringe of that stormy pattern. So we got just as many lightning strikes as they did in Naples, but we didn't get the rain to also put them out. When I flew over the Ellison fire, not only was I pleased to see that ecologically preferable mosaic pattern, green within the black, I was also impressed by the fire line, the very distinct line in the sand that the firefighters were able to draw to protect what would have otherwise been on the other side of that buggy trail, buckskin trail, very drought vulnerable part of the ecosystem that shouldn't be burning with the water table so low. This was a, a challenging and complicated fire in a challenging and complicated place that's really unique in the firefighting community. South Florida is like nowhere else in the country with wildfire. And I know a lot of places say that, but I've worked in most of those places and this is really unique. I'm flying it today and seeing how a few buggy tracks are off of trails and seeing the, the mix of burn intensities and severities across the, the 35,000 acres, it, it did great. The teams and the firefighters did an amazing job out here. We'll get those crews back in there this morning and work on that fire a little bit and try to uh, mop that one up and, and get it put in. What I really like seeing at this stage of the fire in this ecosystem and in South Florida is the regrowth that's already happening. Today the, the Mud Lake Complex is 15 fires and, and we have two other fires that are out there as well, so seven, at least 17 fires in the last month. Part of our mission today is to go out and see what other fires are out there.